The scripture passage this morning is from Jude, verses 24 and 25. <clears throat> now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Father, it is a delight to gather as people that love you. We desire to be changed by your word. We adore you and we love you and we thank you for redeeming us and calling us your children, that we belong to you. And Father, through your Holy Spirit, teach us and remind us again of your love for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Okay, so quick question. Did you guys know that Aaron and I meet on a regular basis? That's Aaron right there, just so you know who he is. And we met and we talked about the service today. And can you guess what the main focus of the passage is today? That's a question. You can answer me now. I, I'm told I have to actually say, go ahead and respond. So respond. What's the main? And now everybody's like, well, I ain't going to say because what if I'm wrong? What, what, is, what is it? But kids, what do I say? What, Cara always asks me, what are you preaching on on Sunday? And what do I say? I say, I'm preaching on Jesus. And, and she's like, oh, no, like, be more specific. Like, no, today is Jesus. I mean, every Sunday is Jesus, but like, this is like even more so. I mean, did you see it in all of the songs that we sang? Is he worthy? Who is worthy? Why are we here this morning? Why do we gather as a church? Why do we read his word? Why do we study his word? Why do we do Bible studies together? Why do we pray for each other? Why do we encourage each other? Why do we help each other? Why do we live this life? Why do we hear the words of God and they convict us? Why do we want that as his people? Because we are not here for us. We get benefits, which is awesome, when we worship God and we live for him and, and he saves us and he changes us. But we don't gather here this morning to go, well, I sure hope Aaron doesn't screw up and mess up my worship of Jesus. If Aaron screws up, and he'll be the first one to say he screws up on a weekly basis, if, if that is what determines whether you are worshiping Jesus or whether in that moment he is worthy of your worship, you have missed the point. We've gone through the book of Jude. And he's been really straightforward, right? I mean, he has, he has not minced words. In 20, 23 verses before our passage today, he's called the church. In essence, he says, contend for the faith. Fight for the truth of the gospel message of salvation by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ alone. He's called out those who have made their way into the church in order to preach falsehoods and to teach falsehoods. They are there to deceive the church. He's called them out. He's called out their lives, which he says they've perverted the grace of God into sensuality, meaning they're encouraging sexual immorality, including and specifically probably homosexuality because he refers to Sodom and Gomorrah. And what happened to them? And these false teachers, they not only pervert the grace of God, but they deny Jesus Christ as their master and Lord. He has, Jude has declared that to pursue the passions and desires of these false teachers will lead only to eternal and divine judgment of God away from his mercy and grace in hell forever. But he has also made a clear distinction between these false teachers and those who are the true church. In essence, false teachers are all about themselves and the true church says, how can I make myself less and lift up the worthiness of Jesus Christ and make him the center? 
How can I let go of my own desires and passions? Even if those desires and passions are into sexual immorality and denying Christ as the master, making myself the master, how do I lay those aside and I follow his desires and passions for me and what he wants and what he says that I become a slave to him who's the only good and right master that we could ever follow. Now Jude's final words, he, he leads up to this. He's building up, calls out the false teachers, and then he says, as Christians, you're different. You don't live this life that they're leaving, living. You live this kind of life. And he builds to these final two verses, which in my Bible, is, they call it a doxology. It's an old fancy, I don't know if it's Latin or whatever. It's a fancy word that just means words of praise to God. Words that should not be taken lightly. This is not the, in Jesus' name, amen, now let's eat, kind of, kind of ending to his letter. These are a final reminder by Jude of the greatness of the God that we worship. How is the church able to fulfill Jude's call to contend for the faith? Not by our own power, not by the but by the power of our great God. His eternal greatness is seen and experienced by his people through God's preservation of those whom he saves. Can, can I say that? How do we endure? How do we contend for the faith? Only by the power of God who preserves those whom he saves. And so we're gonna walk through these verses, first, Jude says that God is able to keep them, the Christians, from stumbling. Second, then we're going to talk about how he says God is able to present them blameless before his glory. And what does that mean? Third, God is the source of our salvation. But all of that then points to his worthiness, God's worthiness, Christ's worthiness of eternal greatness. Now those are like really big words and I'm not like hard to understand words, but like, do we talk that way about God nowadays? God is eternally great. So in verse three, when he talks to the church to contend for the faith that was proclaimed to them. In verse 21, they are told to keep or to guard themselves in the love of God. And how does the church stand faithfully against those whose words tickle the ears and tempt the heart? How does one contend for the faith? How does one keep guard in the love of God? Well, it's only through the power of God. You and I are not able to keep ourselves from stumbling and falling away from him. He is. He is able to keep us from stumbling. And Jude's words are not a, a hope. Like, boy, I hope this good thing happens today. No, it's a statement. It's a factual statement. He is able. God will keep you from stumbling. God will guard you against falling to the sensuality and ungodly desires of those who do not love God. Now this word stumbling, don't read into it to say like loss of salvation. Have you ever stumbled while you were walking? You're walking down a side, yeah, some people are smiling like I ain't gonna admit it. You're walking down a sidewalk, you're minding your own business when your toe hits a crack and then suddenly your arms are flailing like a bird and you possibly fall flat on your face, you trip, well, nothing's hurt but your pride. That's, that's the kind of stumbling that, that Jude is, is talking about. This is what it looks like when we trust in our own power to stand in our own faith. If I'm just gonna pick myself up by my bootstraps and today is gonna be a better day, I may have a few good days, maybe even a few good weeks, possibly a good few months or even years. 
But the reality is, is that when we strive in our own power to be faithful to God, you're gonna get tired. You're gonna get worn out. You're gonna get irritated. And then suddenly you're stumbling and you're doubting. But, I love that word, remember? But, one of the greatest words in scripture, but God is able to keep or guard us against stumbling. I cannot prevent myself from stumbling in the faith, from falling in the faith, getting discouraged, but God is. Do we want to fight for his truth? Do we want to stand firm in his love? Then we must remember that it can only be done through the power of God. We may resist stumbling in our own power for a while, but eventually we're going to become weak and we're going to give in. But God never grows tired. God never grows weak. He can and he will keep us faithful to the end. He is able to preserve our faith until we stand before his glory. So say, think of it this way. If we're trying to be faithful to God, if we're trying to, we're reading his word, we're trying to understand it, we're studying it, we're trying to apply it to our lives, we're trying to live this out on a daily basis, and we're doing all of that in our own strength, and we do stumble, it doesn't mean that we're no longer Christians. It doesn't mean that we're no longer adopted, that God has suddenly ripped up the adoption papers and said, well, you messed up, Mark. Now you got to start all over again. That's, that's not what he says. What happens is even if we do stumble, if I am a child of God, I will always be a child of God. And guess what he's going to do? He's going to pick me up from the sidewalk and he's going to say, keep walking. Let me pick you up. Let me take care of you. Trust in me. Trust in me to do this for you. That when your doubt starts, to, when, your, when your faith starts to doubt or you start to doubt your faith and it starts to fall a little bit and you start to become discouraged, turn to me, turn to me. And guess what? I am able to keep you from stumbling. I am able to preserve your faith until the day that you stand before me. Now, the word stand is not necessarily used. Well, at least not in this version. It's not used. But I use that word stand, uh, the word stand intentionally because that word present in the next part of the verse when he says, and to present you. So he is able to present you blameless before the presence of his glory. That word present literally means to make stand. And so Jude is doing a play on words here. God is able to keep us from falling and to stumbling and he's able to make us stand blameless before his presence of his glory. We worship a holy God, meaning that there is no unrighteousness, no wrong, no injustice, no sin in God himself. And those who stand in his presence must be blameless. They must be perfect. There must be no offense to God in them. They must be sinless lest they be utterly destroyed. We see this, if you remember the story uh, on Mount Sinai, Moses goes up on the mountain to receive the commands of God and he's conversing with God in the cloud and he says to God, Moses says to God in Exodus 33, please show me your glory. That's, that's quite a statement. I think we, we look over that, 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 that request of Moses because it is a huge request. Moses desires to see God's face. He wants to see God face to face. He wants to see the fullness of God's character, the fullness of who God is. He's so overwhelmed by the little bit he's received. He's like, this is so good. I want more. And God tells him, Moses, you can't see my face. You can't see me for who I really am. For man shall not see me and live. In essence, he's saying, if, I, if you see my face, if you see me for who I really am, you will no longer exist. 
my glory is so good and so wonderful and so awesome. Now Moses was a prophet. He was a man of God, the one called to lead God's people out of slavery and into the promised land. And yet even Moses was not blameless. Now fast forward to Jude's letter, and he now proclaims that God is able to present his church to make them stand blameless in the midst of his great glory. In other words, as the church, God allows us and will allow us to see him face to face in all of his fullness and all of his great glory. Now you and I are not able to do a thing right now, nor would we be able to do it in eternity if it was not for him because he's the one who makes us blameless. He is the one who will preserve our faith to the end. He is the one who will make us stand in confidence before his glory. And he is the only one who can save us from his wrath for our sins. As he tells his people in Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Or the uh, another translation might be, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And now Jude says he is the only God who saves. That there is no other God before him. And this doesn't mean that, that God is the highest or most senior of a group of gods. It's that he is the only one God. There is only one God and his name is Yahweh. His name is the Lord. He alone is God and he alone is our savior. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Should have memorized by now. I think we've said it like 50 times in the last 10 weeks. Okay, that's an exaggeration. For by grace you have been saved through faith. That's your salvation, right? You've been saved by God's grace through faith in Christ. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God not a result of works, so that no one may boast. We cannot save ourselves. Money cannot buy our way into his eternal presence. Our family and friends can do nothing to make us blameless and sinless before God. Even our good works are considered filthy rags before God. Our good works are worthless when it comes to our salvation. There are some really good and kind people in this world who will be spending eternity in hell away from the presence of his glory. And that's because only God can save us from the wrath, from his wrath for our sinful rebellion against him. A good life is not a perfect life. Something must be done in order for us to be saved. And so God did it. He did it by sending his son to die for us. Now, all of these things, his keeping us, his presenting us, his saving us, drive we who believe, we who are the church, it drives us to see his eternal greatness. Now to him, the only God, be glory and majesty and dominion and authority. To be given glory is to be given weight, honor, and fame. It's to acknowledge God for who he has been, for who he is, and for who he will always be. The glorious one who is worthy of all, uh, worthy of receiving all glory and honor and praise. That's the God we worship. If you're worshiping the worship team, if you're worshiping the pastor, if you're worshiping the eloquence of speech, if you're worshiping the building, if you're worshiping the walkie tacos we're gonna have in about 15 minutes, they're all gonna fail you because they will all be burned up in the end and all will that will be left is him. I hope you know what I mean. Like we're not gonna be destroyed as God's people. But all those things that we put our worship to, all those things that we give praise and honor and glory. We talked about this at men's breakfast yesterday. If you're a man and you, didn't, you weren't able to go or you didn't even know what's happening, talk to me afterwards. 
man, it was a great discussion because it was a reminder of Ephesians 1. You want to, you want, I thought about just reading that and saying amen and going home because Ephesians 1 says this. Who am I? I am a believer. I am a son of Jesus Christ. And I cannot take credit for it. I can't. I am not worthy of praise, but he is worthy of eternal praise, eternal greatness. Why? Because he is God. He is great. He is glorious. That is who we worship. That is who we follow. God's majesty, God's majesty is his greatness. If you've ever stood before Mount Hood, and anybody been to Mount Hood in Oregon? You ever seen it face to face? Not a picture. Nobody? Really? Yeah, thank you. One person. That's awesome. Okay, if you've ever been to the Northwest, really any of those mountains that are up there, it's like you have a mountain range and then there's this giant mountain. Uh, for Mount Hood, it's, it, you should Google it after church. Okay, take a look at Mount Hood. It's like suddenly, it's as if God put his finger underneath the crust of the earth and he just pushed up a single huge mountain to dominate all other mountains in the area. Uh, to, to use a biblical term, it's a mountain that projects majesty and greatness. You stand in front of that mountain, you feel itty bitty. You're tiny. You seem insignificant. But compared to God, Mount Hood is a molehill. It's nothing. Psalm 8.1 says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. For the name of God to be majestic is more than just saying his name, Yahweh. In the Bible, a name speaks to one's character. It speaks to who they are. For God to be given majesty is to proclaim the greatness of his character. That there is no one and there is nothing like him in all of creation. O Lord, O Lord, how majestic are you in all the earth. God's dominion and authority, the last two in this list of four. God's dominion and authority have to do with his power and his rule. His realm as king is not limited by borders or treaties. So it's not like God is king over us while we're here in this building and then we're going to go to work and God like removes, his, he's, he's not king of that realm. Or he's, he has dominion over the earth, but you know, if you go to Mars, sorry, he's not there. <laughs> That's not who the God is that we worship. His eternal sorry, his kingdom, his reign is not limited to anything. His dominion is all of creation. He is king of all things in all places in all of the universe, meaning that he also has all authority over all things in his realm. He has every right to exercise his power in his realm as he sees fit, whether we like it or not. <laughs> because we are not God, he is. We are not king, he is. And he alone is worthy to rule and exercise his power in and over his dominion. Now, was it true that in Genesis, he says to Adam and Eve, be fruitful to multiply, have dominion over all of creation. Yeah, but he's not saying become God. He's saying have dominion over what I've created by the way I'm over you because <laughs> I am the one who created it, including you. He has dominion and rule over all things and he is alone is worthy to have that power. So how does he do these things? How is God able to keep us from stumbling? How is he able to present us blameless before his glory? How is he able to save us from his wrath? How are we able to proclaim his glory, majesty, dominion, and authority? Well, he says, 
verse 25, to the only God, our Savior, through who? I'm asking. Jesus Christ. So it's not just one thing. It's all of this. All that he says in these two verses. How was he able to do it? Or maybe you should say not how able to do it. How does he do it? He does it through Christ Jesus our Lord. Jude has just told the church, don't be surprised when the world acts like the world. When unbelievers who do not love Christ and his commands, they don't live the life of obedience to Christ. That, that makes sense, right? We shouldn't be surprised when those who do not believe in Christ as master and Lord continue to stumble or unable to stand blameless before God. They reject the salvation, mes- salvation message of Christ. They refuse to acknowledge the eternal greatness of the Lord. We should not be shocked by this. Because only those who know Christ, those who trust in Christ, those who believe in him as Savior, who have a relationship with him, who love him and his commands, only those who are striving to more and more submit themselves under his dominion authority will see God for who he truly is. That he is worthy of all glory and majesty and dominion and authority, not just today, but forever. God will preserve to the end those whom he saves. His eternal greatness will let them do nothing less to those who belong to him. If we love the, the desires and the passions of God, if we're striving daily to love and follow his commands, if we're striving to contend for the faith within the church, life of the church and within our own hearts, then we can stand firm in the faith. Not because we have made ourselves perfect in our ways. Not that as a church that we've got everything put together. Not because we have made our own hearts blameless before God. See, see God, I, I, I followed you at least 80% of the time this week. Isn't that a good thing? He demands 100%, by the way. We cannot... None of this happens in our own selves, in our own perfection, but because through Christ, he has made and will keep us perfect and blameless before him. Through Christ, through Jesus Christ, God has saved us from his wrath for our sinful rebellion against him. Through Christ, he proclaims his eternal greatness to us and to the world. This is the God that we worship. This is the God that we're striving to follow. This is the God in whom we believe and trust. This is the God who will empower us to contend for the faith as given to us in his word. This is the God who will preserve us until the day that we stand in his glorious presence. Usually, if you've been here long enough, you've heard this before, we we tend to like, here's the five-step application for you. If we do this and this and this and this, then we will see his glorious grace. Well, here's the application. Sometimes we just need to sit in the truth of who God actually is and who we are in God. Not because of what we think, but because of what he says. And he says, you are mine because I've made you mine. You will, you will contend for the faith because I will empower you to contend for the faith. You will love me because I've given you that love for me. You will persevere to the end because I will preserve you to the end. Now, as we live our life, yes, he says, strive to obey the commands. Obey the commands of God. Obey the commands of God. If you love me, you will obey my commands. That's what Christ says. And the reality is, is that we struggle in that. And even in that struggle, it's a reminder as God's people. So as you're going out this week, right, school has started. 
life has become crazy and you're trying to sit into the schedule that you have created for yourself and trying to get used to that. Things, things are piling up. Life gets hard. Things happen in the world. Frustrations come up and you're striving to be faithful and those hard times come. Who do you turn to? Now, maybe we, we might resist and try our hardest. Like, well, no, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna push, I'm gonna just, but eventually as God's people, he, is, he brought you here this morning to remind you, who do you worship? And if you, yeah, thank you. If you worship God, if you worship the God of scripture, the one who saved you, he's not gonna leave you or forsake you. He is going to go with you. And as God's people, he's reminding you, this is not about you, Mark. This is about me. Because I am worthy of all glory and honor and praise. And that is not arrogance if it's true. It's not arrogance when it comes to God. Because he is the only one who is worthy of all glory and all honor and all praise. And he is worthy not just now, but as Jude says, before all time and now and forever. And then he ends it with, amen. It is so. Truly, truly, truly. This is who God is. Remember who you are in Christ. And if you, don't, if you don't know him, if you don't have that confidence, if you have n- no faith in God, then hear his words that those who believe in him, you put your trust in him and not in yourself. You make him master and Lord of your life. You hear the truth of the grace of God saying there is no sin that is too great that God cannot and will not forgive. And you become a slave to him in a good way. Slave, because there's nothing better than being slave of a great master. (laughs) A good, righteous, just master. And to live a life that glorifies him and not ourselves. Not the world around us. Not the church. Not family. Not friends. But to the only one who is worthy of all glory, majesty, dominion, and authority. We're about to sing a song. Christ is all. (laughs) And sometimes it's hard to actually mean that if you're going through a hard time. But this song is a reminder He is all, that no matter what comes our way, no matter what storms we experience, He is all. All I need is Him. He will take care of me. He will guide me. He will will get me through this difficult time. He will preserve my faith to the end. He will give me the, the strength to contend and to fight for the truth of who God is and what His gospel message is no matter what. Christ is all. And only God's people can say that. If you don't know him, put your faith in him. If you do know him, then stand confident. We do not worship a tiny God. We worship the only God. Father, use these words to encourage us, to grab a hold of our hearts, to to remind us, God, our lives as your people. Our lives are a a well of praise or should be a well of praise to you. You preserve us. You keep us from stumbling. You you are able to do that. And so in those moments when, when our faith seems to be faltering, when we are stumbling, remind us as your people, 
You are all in all. You are good. You are the God. You are the only God who is worthy and able. Help us to stand in that. Help us to be confident in you and not ourselves, Father. And for those around us, those who are even here this morning, who cannot have that confidence, God, that you would grab a hold of their hearts, soften it, reveal your grace, change their hearts. Let them hear the truth that only through Christ can we be forgiven and have confidence that we will stand with you forever in heaven. We ask this in your precious name. Amen.